Hey guys, welcome to this class on what's going to be the ultimate quick start guide to guitar chords. We're going to run through everything that you need to know to get you started playing lots of songs and a lot of great sounding chords on guitar. All within about, I'm hoping for around 30 minutes of actual uh, learning time. To follow along with the lesson, we're going to be running through the uh, course book here. So you can download and print out your copy to follow along just by clicking on the link below. So let's get started. There's actually just 10 chords that we need to really get going with all of this to kind of lay down your foundation. So you may or you may not know uh, already these chords, but if you don't, there's another video on the site that'll explain how to form each one in detail, but we're just gonna run through them quickly now. So we're gonna need um, a C chord. And notice here that I'm using my thumb to block out the sixth string because it sounds bad against the chord, for example doesn't really work okay so it's important to either avoid strumming it or to use your thumb to mute it out from there we're going to need a D minor chord it looks like this and here again you're muting out the low E string okay it's going to sound very bad it just doesn't fit in so again you want to get rid of it and uh, you can use the open fifth string however that's going to be fine but technically the root note is the fourth string. Uh, we're gonna need an E minor chord, which is one of the easier ones to learn. Sounds like this. And um, you can hold it with fingers one and two or fingers two and three, ideally both ways. And then we're gonna need the dreaded F chord. So the easiest version of an F that you can do is gonna be third fret here on the fourth string second fret on the third string and first fret on the second string. So it's like, that's really an F major seven, but you can use it as an F chord substitute in case the other versions are too hard for you yet. It'll work perfectly fine with a lot of songs, kind of get out of jail F chord. Uh, if you want to do a proper F, then uh, the next version up in difficulty would be here where you bar, it's the same shape, but you just bar these top two strings with your first finger. Okay, so you'd have this high F note now. And one of the secrets to getting that to come out is to kind of grip your guitar like a baseball bat so that the neck kind of is fitting into the palm at the back here. So you have like this baseball bat, bat grip. Just like that. Um, next up, we're going to G chord. I'm sure everyone knows that one. And then we're going to need an A minor. That again is from the, um, the fifth string down. And I'm muting out the low E. It won't sound terrible if you include your low E because it is a part of the chord. But you just get a cleaner, more pure sounding A minor if you omit the sixth string. And then we're going to need uh, some kind of a B minor, which again is really uh, one of the harder chords for beginners to learn. Again, the easiest version would be the open fourth string, then the fourth fret on the third string, third fret on the second, and first fret, sorry, second fret on the first string. So you have like, that's the easiest version of B minor or one of the easiest ones. Uh, but of course, if you can do your full bar chord shape, that's all the better. You can hear it sounds a lot stronger. Then we're going to need some kind of a D chord. This one obviously is the most popular. That's again with the root note on the fourth string, but you can include your fifth as well. Don't include your low E on this one. It's going to sound really bad. Okay, it just really clashes. Um, then we're going to need an E chord strum all six strings across there and finally an A chord with your A chord you can hold it with fingers two three and four or one two and three or you can also do this version where you have the second fret so your second finger then your first finger and then your third finger it really de depends upon the size of your fingers which version or shape you're going to find uh, easiest to hold an A chord with so you can experiment with that so uh those are the 10 essential chords that we need to get going. If you don't know how to form any of those shapes or you weren't able to pick it up just there, um, I've done a second video where I do a close up and um, I show you how to form the chord kind of step by step. So uh, that's it for this first step 
on here on page one is to learn your 10 essential okay open chords then uh, next one we have to go on to is uh, how to organize those chords into a system okay so it's no point in just learning a bunch of random chords because you don't know how they work together or what to do with them so uh the way that we actually organize chords is by putting them into keys and a key is basically like a little family of chords a collection of them seven seven chords where they all work together they all agree with each other and kind of like uh, forms a little musical world that sounds good and songs get written inside of keys there's uh 24 different keys but we can start off just by learning two of them it's kind of all we need to get going the first key we're going to learn is the key of c and again there's seven chords that we're going to cover here so um you're starting off with a C chord, obviously, because we're in the key of C. And then chord number two is D minor. Chord number three is E minor. Chord four is F. Chord five is G. Chord six, e, A minor. And then chord seven is B diminished before it resolves back into C. So we know all of those chords except for the diminished one at the end. And um, I'll show you how to do that now. It's going to be the second fret on the fifth string and then the second fret on the third string. So you're skipping over a string there. Then you're going to come in here on the third fret of the fourth string and then the uh, third fret of the second string with the other two fingers. So it's a very symmetrical shape with a lot of tension because it has tritone intervals inside of it. But all of that tension and energy gets resolved into a place of rest when you resolve into C. So once again you have C, let's go through the key, into D minor, E minor, F, then G, A minor, B diminished, C. So I'm sure you could hear how we created a little musical world using those seven chords where everything fit in really well together. The next key that we can uh, do using the chords we already learned is the key of G. So once again, we're starting on a G chord as our tonic. This is chord number one. Chord two now would be an A minor. Chord three is B minor. Chord 4 is C. Chord 5 is D. Chord 6 E minor. Chord 7 is F sharp diminished. Hear all the tension there again, and it's going to resolve back into G. For F sharp diminished, it's the same shape as B diminished, it's just starting in a different place here on the first fret of the fourth string. So you, once you learn your B, diminished. Just transpose that entire shape with your first finger now starting on the first fret of the fourth string and you're going to have your F sharp diminished. These diminished shapes, the seventh chord, they really don't get used a whole lot in pop songs, although the Beatles did find some really ingenious ways of including diminished chords into pop songs, which is really, really clever. But genuinely, uh, you don't use them too much. So we're using them or learning them mostly just to be able to complete a full key on guitar. So um, that's kind of like step two. Once you have learned your 10 essential shapes, the next step is to organize them into the two keys that we've just been through, the key of C and the key of G. And make sure that you memorize those so that you don't have to look at the sheet or nothing like that. You can just play them from memory. Once you have those two steps, the next thing to add in to the mix is going to be the use of a capo or capo, depending on which way you want to pronounce it. Um, and they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and price points. So my one here is just an example. Um, and what happens is that we can uh, place this somewhere on our guitar, say here on the second fret. And you always want to place it kind of just behind the fret. And um, now we can take all of the chords and the two keys that we've learned and play them in front of the capo position. 
and that instantly allows us to play in a ton of new keys. As I mentioned, there's 24 keys. So for example, now we can have or if we move it, say down one fret, now we're in a different key. Or what about up? say onto the fourth fret. See how handy it is? You don't have to learn any new chords. You simply move your capo to different positions up and down the neck and playing in the key of C and the key of G. Now you have a really extended range of keys that you can play in. And this is really important because obviously not all songs are written in the key of C or the key of G. They could be in something like uh, A flat or C sharp, you know, all these different keys. So using the capo and the 10 chords organized into the two keys, using that combination gives us the power to play in a lot of different keys and a lot of different songs simply by adding in a capo into the mix. So uh, on the next page, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about how to make your chords sound perfect. So what happens is that a lot of beginners um, will learn the shape of a chord, but it still sounds awful, even though their fingers are in the right uh, place. So there's three reasons normally for this, and then you can go through kind of as a checklist. So say if we're uh, having chord of C as an example, all right, so uh, it can be that you might find that you have like a buzzing sound on one of the strings or perhaps one of the strings is muted out and it's not sounding. So the way to check, to check that is just to choose your chord and then go down string by string. And we want to make sure that every string within the chord is sounding nice and clear, okay? So you get a full sounding uh, chord. So the first thing is kind of obvious, which means that you want to make sure that you're pressing down hard enough on each point, okay? For beginners, it hurts, you know, when you start learning to play. And uh, for this reason, a lot of beginners avoid pressing down hard because it's hurting their fingers. But uh, it's just something you have to persevere with, a little pain barrier to go through until the calluses build up on the tops of your fingers and then it's going to stop hurting. But until then, you might find that some of your chords aren't working simply because on certain points, you're not actually pressing down hard enough to make the note come out. So that's the first thing to check. Then you want to make sure that you're uh, placing your fingers just behind the frets wherever possible. So within this third fret, I could place my finger back here at the back, or I could place it at the front. And given the choice, it's always better to place your fingers directly behind each fret. So you can see here behind the third, here behind the second, and here behind the first, right? So you're just behind the fret. So my C shape is pushed forward to the front rather than being at the back. And um, on every chord, it's not possible, but wherever it is, try to endeavor to get your fingers just behind the frets. And that will help you to eliminate a lot of buzzing noises that can happen if you're playing, you know, with your fingers more towards the back. And then the uh, final thing is to make sure that you're using the very, very tips of your fingers to press down. So you don't want to have kind of flat fingers like this where you're pressing down more here, okay? When you press down on the very top part of your fingers, you're forming like these right angles. You can see kind of 90 degree angles with your joints there. And what happens is it helps to clear away the flesh from the bottom of your fingers from impeding upon the string immediately below, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're not having flat fingers, but you're raising them up onto the very tips of your fingers so that the flesh here, you know, is not impeding upon the string below of each finger like that. So you're clearing them out of the way. So that's like a three point checklist for getting perfect sounding chords. So you wanna press down hard enough, make sure that your fingers are at the front of the frets wherever possible, and that you're forming these right angles with every chord shape that you hold. So you're clearing your fingers out of the way. So that's uh, normally if you obey those three rules, you're gonna get perfect sounding really good chords for every shape that you hold. Okay, so um, on the next page, we're gonna talk about now speeding up the uh, speed at which you can uh, 
change chords, okay, this is very important. Because obviously if you can't keep up with the chord changes in a song, you're not going to be able to play it. You're going to be constantly left behind. So the first thing to talk about there is going to be on chord connectors. And these are points where we don't have to lift off fingers between chords. For example, if we had an E minor in a song progression going to a G, we can afford to keep our first finger where it is between those two changes. It doesn't make any sense to take it off and then just put it back down in the same place again. So between E minor and G, we can keep our finger, first finger as an anchor point between those two changes. And there's six of these chord connectors that you can use. So obviously they're the first one, E minor to G. And we also have, say, E minor to C. And now your second finger is able to stay where it is between those two shapes. And this is going to help you to really speed up the change a lot because you have that common ground already in place. We also have E minor to A minor, which is again, your second finger can stay where it is between those two changes. So E minor to G, like this, E minor to C, like this, and E minor to A minor, like that. Again, this is all in the, um, the diagrams, so you can go through and really practice and perfect that set. Then we have um, other ones, which would be, say, A minor to C, we just need to move the third finger out to get between an A minor and a C chord, which is, makes it really fast. And we also have A minor to F, where you can keep your first finger stationary between the two chord shapes, like this. And then we also have C to F, where you can keep your first finger stationary and just flick up and down between C and F, like that. So make sure that you uh, are aware of those six connectors and that you're using them anytime you come into chord progression. So for example, if we took, say, a progression of G to E minor, C and A minor. So here we have a lot of connectors that we can immediately use. So from G to E minor, keep my first finger where it is. And then into C, I can keep my second finger. And then to get to A minor, I just move my third finger back. And then at the end, I have to change everything but to get back to G. But before that, you know, in the preceding chords, I was able to use a connector to join them all up together, which is really going to help you to speed up your chord changes if you're just starting. Another example progression we have here is going from um, a C into F to A minor and E minor. So again, let's break that down. We have a C chord going to F so we can keep our first finger where it is. And then going into A minor, your first finger again stays. And then into E minor, your second finger can stay. And going from E minor back into C, your second finger can stay again. So the whole progression is linked together with uh, these chord connectors. So that's the first thing that I would recommend that you really master is learning those six chord connectors. And that's going to help to instantly speed up a lot of your chord changes. Then the next thing we can look at is uh, train lines, which is uh, something similar. Say, for example, we have an E chord going to A. Well, what we could do is take everything off and you have your first finger here and would slide up, okay, one fret, and then you can place the other fingers around it to form your A chord. And going back down, an E, and then slide into A. kind of related to connectors in that you're never lifting off your first finger you're simply sliding it up and down one fret like that so it can help you to get between an E change and an A change another example would be if we have say an A chord and we're going to D so here would be the third finger that simply slides up one fret never leaving the string and now you can form your D chord like that and then going back down you can slide back down into A back up into D. Then uh, finally, 
we can use a really, really powerful practice technique, which is called uh, pressure points. So for this, you're going to need the use of a metronome. Um, I get mine over here. Again, these come in a lot of different price points and designs, and just gives you a basic click that you can uh, you can use, and you can set the tempo of the click. So this is set at around uh, 80 beats per minute now. So what happens is that you would choose a uh, say a chord change that you're working on. You're having trouble, for example, getting from um, C to E minor. So you'd start your metronome off slowly and try and do the chord change. So you'd have... Okay, so you're able to do it in time with the metronome at that speed. And then you go up, say, to the next point, which may be like, say, 92 beats per minute. And then again, work your way up, say, to 108 beats per minute. So in each case, you're getting faster and faster and faster. Now at a certain point, you're going to, uh, it's all going to fall apart. It's going to be too fast for you to keep up with the metronome. And that's that point where it all falls apart. You just can't quite keep up with the metronome. That's your pressure point. And what you want to do is kind of write that down. So for this particular example of C to E minor, say your pressure point was 140 beats per minute. And now that you know that, you can slow down your metronome, say, by 10 or 15 beats per minute, and then work your way up to the pressure point, and then back down, and then back up again. So you're always spending the majority of your practice time in and around that pressure point. And what happens is that your fingers start to feel pressure to make the chord change in time with the metronome. And when you introduce that little bit of pressure, a kind of teaspoon of pressure, it's going to make your rate of improvement skyrocket on guitar and your all your chord changes are going to get a lot faster very quickly so rather than taking you know your chords and spending all the time in the world going from one to the other kind of in a relaxed way you won't improve very quickly if you do that but as soon as you introduce your metronome and a bit of pressure to have to get to the chord change in time with the click your fingers are going to respond to that and they're going to kind of try a lot harder and your rate of improvement is uh, going to grow up a lot because of that. So that's honestly the most powerful technique that I can give you for chord changing speeds. Aside from using your connectors or using your train lines, this third thing that you can do, pressure point with the metronome, is really, really powerful. So once again, you start off slow, and then you keep increasing the metronome until you find where it all falls apart. And then you write that down to your pressure point, and then you stay within 20 beats per minute Okay, of that pressure point going up and down each time you practice it. And by staying practicing in and around that pressure point where it's you feel under pressure to get to the chord change, but it's not so much that it becomes impossible. Okay, so it's that type of feeling that you want. And when you spend the majority of your practice time in and around that point, you're going to find that you improve or start to improve much faster on guitar. So um, that's the final point there for this page. Next thing we want to go on to is kind of making your chords sound a lot more uh, colorful and interesting because after a while, beginner chords, they start to sound well, boring, okay, because you're always using the same chords in the same progressions with the same strumming patterns and it just gets tired. There are some people that are doing the same chords and progressions on guitar for five years or more and then just never make it out of beginner guitar. That's really common. So um, what I'm going to give you is some ways that you can break out of beginner guitar and add a lot of extra depth and color and class sophistication into your chords. So uh, the key to do that is by learning different families of chords. So as an example here, uh, we're going to learn major seven chords. So an example, say if we have C... 
regular C chord and C major 7 we can get it just by removing the first finger it sounds a lot softer and we can uh, kind of form a family out of that so we'd have like a D major 7 would sound like this and here it has the same sound quality we can also do E major 7 or F major 7 G major 7. Again, if we had a G. See how the chord changes its tonal character. It's still a G, but it's like a different color. Um, we also have this one, A major 7. And again, the diagrams for these uh, first six major seven shapes that you should learn are in the course book here as well. So uh, we can get now progression. So instead of saying G to C normally, we can now substitute that, say, for G major seven to C major seven. instantly we get a different flavor it sounds deeper it's more musical has a bit more sophistication and class to it so we're starting to break away out of these tireless beginner chords that everyone else is doing another example may be say going from a major 7 to d major 7 <laughs> Major 7 to C. Now we can move on to another family of chords which would be minor 7s and we just have three shapes here that are most useful when you first get going. So we have uh, an A major, sorry, A minor 7 sounds minor but it's like the diet coke version of a minor chord it's kind of um a little more open sounding than a full minor see how the full minor is sounding more dense where the minor seven sounds slightly more open then we have a d minor seven again the same chord quality and also e minor seven Again, the diagrams for those three chords are in the course book. So, um, you can also put those into uh, progressions too. For example, we could have like um, G into C major 7, then A minor 7, and a D. Then the last family of chords to go into for now are going to be dominant seven chords. So the next page I've listed out the six shapes that we need for these ones, the most commonly used ones. Uh, let's have a look again, say, at a normal C chord, and then C7 or C dominant seven. C changes the character of the chord instantly. So can use a D7 and an E7, uh, G7, A7, and a B7. So those are the six uh, dominant seven chords that you should learn. Again, diagrams are there for you to learn. Now, once we have, I'm sure you're wondering what the whole point of this is, right? Because again, we're just learning a bunch of random chords, but how do we actually make them useful into a musical situation. How do we make music using it? Well, we can start to combine these different chord families together to really lift the chord progressions up to a new level. So we could use, say, a G chord into A minor 7, and then into C major 7, and then into 
into D7. So I'm using all the different families of chords there. I have a major chord with the G, a minor 7 chord with the A minor, a major 7 chord with the C, and a dominant 7 chord with the D. So by mixing these together, I start to get more interesting progressions. We can hear how that D7 at the end, because of the tritone, it has desire to resolve back into G. look at another example where we'll mix them up together. Um, this is the final one on the page here. We're going from A minor into F major 7 and C major 7 and now an E7. I'm sure you're hearing already how we're um, instantly making our chord progressions sound a lot more musical, giving them a lot more depth, simply because we're combining different families of chords together. So first of all, you can learn all your regular chords, but if you want to break out a beginner guitar, at some point you have to get a bit more sophisticated with your chords and start to combine different families of chords together. And that's how we add color into these progressions. On the next page we have more examples here of this at work. Say we take a G chord and we're going to switch the tonal color into G major 7 and then into C major 7 and a D7. Take a look at progression number four now. So we have E minor into G. So those are both regular beginner chords. Now we break into C major seven, a bit more sophisticated, and then down into B seven, which is a dominant seven chord. take these uh, chord families a step further again and you can actually go into this really really deeply but obviously it requires time so it's best to do it you know step by step by step but just as an as an example uh, the final one here that I've listed is if we have like a really standard beginner progression like D going to G then E minor going to A so a very regular chord progression. And now we're going to add in substitutions. So for the, um, instead of D, we're going to add in D major seven sus two. And then instead of G, we'll use G major seven. Then instead of E minor, an E minor 9 and instead of A we'll do A7 so instantly your ears it sounds a lot more fresh to your ears it has a lot more depth to it So I hope that you're able to trace the line all the way through that. So in the very beginning, 
we started off by learning the 10 essential chord shapes. But we didn't just learn them as random chords. We then went into organizing them into two keys. The key of C, which had seven chords, and the key of G, which had seven chords too. Then we took that and we massively expanded the power by adding in a capo, where you place it on your guitar at different points up and down the neck. And now all of a sudden, without learning any more new chords, but you could play instead of just in two keys, but a ton of different keys. Then we went through how to make the quality of your chords sound uh, much better by using that three-point checklist because obviously there's no point in holding a chord if half the notes aren't coming out. It's just going to sound crap. So you need to make sure that the quality of your chords is perfect, so each note ringing out. And from there, we're able to start developing into um, chord changing speeds. So using three techniques using the connectors, right, where you can keep fingers stationary between the chords. We had six of those. And then we had train lines between E and A, and also A and D. And finally, we had that really powerful pressure point technique that you can use with your metronome. And if you don't have a metronome, I would encourage you to buy one. They're not really that expensive. But in the meantime, you can also just search for uh, an online metronome. And again, on the website, I've got one there that you can use straight away as well. Then we uh, went into colorizing chords, okay? So we want to break out of this beginner guitar sound by getting more sophisticated with our tonal color inside the chords. So we learned new chord families, which were major sevens, minor sevens, and dominant sevens. And then again, to organize that new information, I gave you examples of how we could mix and match those different chord families together into actual progressions. And you were able to hear how you had the boring beginner version and then the new and improved, more sophisticated version of that same progression simply by including uh, chords from these other families. So that's really enough information there for you to uh, go quite a long time and quite a long way with your guitar playing. You can play hundreds of songs with this information. All you need to do is just uh, practice it enough to the point where it becomes very familiar, almost automatic to the point where you could just do it in your sleep. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed everything that we've covered here. Remember, you can print off the course book to go along with everything, all the diagrams and the progressions, all the advice is written out inside of there. Just print it off and um, spend time, you know, practicing and going through it so that you have at least the chord side of your guitar playing uh, to quite a polished level. Obviously, you have your finger style or your strumming. That's a whole other subject, right, for a different lesson. And so I hope, you, again, once again, that you've uh, enjoyed going through all of this uh, material. And I look forward to seeing you in the next class.